Welcome to the 6th episode of Oblivion Good Content, the Removed Arenas. You may have seen a video or two on this topic before, but I guarantee you, you will learn something new today. If not, there will be a refund. To start off, yes, there was once an arena in every city in Oblivion. But why were they removed? Well, for once there is a clear answer to that question. I'll let one of Oblivion's developers, Emil Pagliarulo, explain it all. Yeah, the arena was, uh... I mean, one of the things, I don't know if people know this, but one of the things we really struggled on in Oblivion is, um, you know, fitting all the audio assets on the disc. And we had too much dialogue. And the arena that's in the game, that's in Oblivion, is in the Imperial City. At one point, there was an arena in every city. So, and I had already done the work. I mean, I had written the dialogue and everything. And, and we had gotten to a point where we really needed to cut back on dialogue. And, and so I ended up cutting out all the other arenas in the other cities, and that included 800 lines of specifically written dialogue. Just gone, done, bye. You know what I mean? Um, so that was painful. But it was actually the right choice because I think, you know, having one arena in the game was much more manageable and, and much more fun from a player standpoint too. So I think it was one of those things where a crappy situation led to a better game, you know. But it was, it was definitely painful when it happened though, yeah. But yeah, because of disk space limitations, all of the other arenas were shelved and only one was kept. Despite this, we can still make out a lot of what didn't make the final cut. There are two places that I need to mention here, Kvatch and Such. Due to Such being completely removed, there is nothing known about its arena or any of the related NPCs that would have been there. Kvatch on the other hand still has an arena in the final game, albeit a completely destroyed one. Why does it have one? Well, that's simple in order to make it match up with all the other cities that had arenas. When the others went, the developers decided to let the Kvatch arena stay. They gave an NPC a throwaway line about it and voila, its existence was justified, I guess. Now, every city's arena was meant to have a gatekeeper responsible for bets, a blade master in order to fight in the arena, a champion that likely stayed in the bloodworks, local citizens visiting and possibly some more generic combatants as well, like the blue team gladiator and the yellow team champion in the final game. There's also another person present in the final game's arena, Isabel Andronicus, who has the rank of Battle Matron, but I think she was created late into the arena's lifespan, and I don't think that the other arenas would have had a Battle Matron. Another quote-unquote attraction that each arena would have had is that one of the city's beggars would take place outside of the arena to beg. Most beggars still have this package in use in the final game. But that's about enough small talk. Let's delve into this, starting with the removed Anvil Arena. The first question we need to ask is where would this arena have been located? Well, there's one leftover marker called Anvil Arena Gate Marker that indicates that the arena would have stood where there's now the mermaid statue with the pond. It was likely added there as to not leave the area completely barren. There are some cells in the final game that still mention Anvil's arena, but there's nothing interesting to talk about with those since they just carry the name, but are just normal cells in every other way. I also have to mention that there is an unused AI package called Anvil Beggar to Arena, but since it isn't used by anyone, we don't know which beggar would have appeared here. Okay, so who would have been the Blade Master in Anvil? Well, that's a difficult question to answer, because all Blade Masters were completely removed from the game. However, in Anvil's case, it was most likely a male Imperial whose first name was Andras. In the Anvil NQD script, it lists the people that are important enough to get rumors in the city. The script uses first names and there's only one name that doesn't appear in the final game, which is Andras. Of course, this doesn't confirm anything, but these two leftover packages do. Andrus Stand and Andrus Sleep. All of the Blade Master packages use this naming convention, so at least we know who the Blade Master was meant to be. But do we also know who the Gatekeeper was meant to be? Well, kind of, as the Gatekeepers actually didn't get deleted. They were all just repurposed in the final game. Another factor making identifying them quite easy is that they all share a greeting in the final game. This one to be exact. Have a good day now. If you've ever heard an NPC say this line, that's why. They're all conditioned to only be said by arena gatekeepers. But who was the lucky one in Anvil? Well, that would be Didier Omeli. Or maybe not. Why not? Well, Didier Omeli in the final game is a Breton, but he's internally referred to as Imperius Versetti, which is an Imperial name. So it could be that the Imperial Imperius Versetti was once the gatekeeper, but I'm not quite sure of that. What I am sure of is that Didier's greeting in the final game originally didn't exist, as it wasn't recorded by the old Breton voice actor Wes Johnson. His Anvil topic line, however, 
did exist at the time. Oh, also of note is that the new Breton voice actor did not record the Have a Good Day Now line, so all Breton gatekeepers weirdly enough say the line without any voice dialogue. Although this might have been intentional, as we'll learn in the future. But for now, let's recap. We know where Anvil's arena was, we know who the gatekeeper was meant to be, and we know who the blade master was meant to be. Sadly, there are no other leftovers related to the Anvil arena in the final game or otherwise. Our first arena might have been a bust, but let's see if we can get some more info on the next one. Bravil's removed arena. Once again, we get a hint at the arena's location due to the fact that we have a single leftover marker known as Bravil Arena Patrol Marker. This indicates that the Bravil arena would have been located behind the Lonely Suitor Lodge and the Archer's Paradox, where a statue now stands. In the final game, guards still patrol this area, because they were once meant to patrol in front of the arena, but Bethesda simply kept their AI as is. This was also behavior that was meant to occur in every city, where guards would be stationed at the local arena. Once again, there is a leftover AI package for the local beggars, this time it's actually assigned to someone as well. Beggar Ratchet Aya still has a package called Brevil Beggar to Arena, which subsequently would have taken her to her leftover marker. I think this is due to Oblivion assigning the nearest marker alphabetically after another one is deleted, because there were actually dedicated markers for the local beggars made, as we'll find out. Of course, that is an assumption by me, but Dazda is known for their weird design decisions after all. So with all of that out of the way, who was meant to be Breville's Blade Master? Well, that's an even trickier question than before. I do have a semi-satisfying answer for you. Part of her answer can once again be found in the city's NQD script. Breville's script also uses first names, and as you can see there's one name that doesn't line up with an NPC in the final game, and that would be Wares. This seems to be the first part of a hyphenated Tamrielic name of an Orgonian. For example, City Swimmer has one such name, and she's referred to in the script as just City. The removed Orgonian Blade Master would have likely had a name like Wears Armor or Wears Heavy Armor. Oblivion's Orgonians usually don't have more than three words as their name, but there are exceptions, so we can be sure. What we can be sure of is that they were male, because a single rumor about them still exists in the files. I believe he's always looking for new members, but I don't think it's for me. This would actually be a response to a question about him, but the question was deleted from the files, making sure this response goes unused as well. Sadly, Wares doesn't have anything else left over, so let's take a look at the local gatekeeper. They were meant to be the wood elf Andragil. She got repurposed as the master trainer in block in the final game, and unlike Didier Omili, Bethesda didn't cover up the fact that she's basically a cut character that got repurposed. She never leaves her house in the final game and she has no unique dialogue outside of the master training quest. Know what dialogue she does have? Have a good day now. Mmm, of course she has that one. Now, while previously we didn't have any more information than the location, blade master and gatekeeper, in Breville we even know who the champion would have been. The champion of the Breville arena would have been Jean-Pierre Lemont. He's a Breton sharpshooter that still appears in the final game, but similar to a lot of these repurposed NPCs, he doesn't even have any unique dialogue and isn't involved in any quests. He's completely insignificant. How do we know that he was meant to be Breville's champion? Well, that's easy. He's still a part of the Arena Champions faction. In the final game, Jean-Pierre resides in Silverholm on the water, but he likely would have lived in the Arena's bloodworks. There is seemingly one package that he uses that's a remnant from his Arena Champion days, which is called Arena Jean-Pierre Saturday. This package seems to imply one of two things. Either this package wasn't changed and Jean-Pierre would have left the arena to go drink in the Lonely Suitor Lodge on Loredas, just like he does in the final game, or it was changed and Jean-Pierre would have had some different schedule on Loredas originally. Personally, I believe it's the former, because it would make more sense for this package to remain unaltered while the others got deleted. It also seems that this hunting package that he used in the final game was created at the same time as his arena package, so it seems likely that even as an arena champion, he would have left the city on Sundas in order to hunt. One final note about Jean-Pierre is that he carries steel arrows and one random enchanted arrow. For some reason he doesn't carry a bow. But still, this fact, coupled with his class, seems to indicate that Jean-Pierre was an archery type champion, so that would have been pretty interesting to see in action. With the location and staff out of the way, do we know any of the people that would have visited the arena? Well, yes we do actually. The Thieves Guild Doyen Scriva was supposed to be a visitor. In Thieves Guild quests, the player can ask beggars for information about the person's whereabouts. 
Normally, beggars direct you to the Lonely Suitor Lodge, but during the quest Lost Histories, your journal actually reads a beggar reminded me that Skrivak can be found at the Lonely Suitor Lodge and at the arena. The dialogue for this quest does actually only mention the lodge, but the journal mentions the arena as well, likely indicating that when the arena was removed, someone just forgot to alter this text in the quest journal. And with that, we've covered all there is to the Breville Arena. Next on the list is the Bruma Arena. The Bruma Arena would have been located where the city's north gate is placed in the final game. There are still two markers in place that indicate this. Bruma Arena Patrol Marker, which indicates where the city's guard would have patrolled, and Bruma Arena Gatekeeper Marker, which indicates where the city's gatekeeper would have stood. But we don't actually have to speculate, as we actually know how the Bruma Arena would have looked in all of its glory, at least from the outside. As for some reason, the Bruma Arena can be seen in the game's E3 trailer. The beggar Fette Joffenheld would have begged here as indicated by his leftover package Bruma Beggar to Arena. Now for the city's Blademaster, well, uh, I don't know. Whoever they were, every trace of them got completely deleted. Bruma has a very short NQD script and everyone mentioned in it is a used NPC. There are no rumors, AI packages or even markers left over, so I can't even begin to guess. I can however tell you who the city's gatekeeper was meant to be. How about you guess for me? Which NPC lives in Bruma and has literally no one mentioned them and plays no role in anything? Well, that would be Isterus Brolus, husband of the illusion trainer Jantus Brolus. If you've seen my episode on Imperial Bretons, then you know that Bethesda likes altering some Imperials' race to Breton, seemingly at random. Well, Isterus is one of those Imperials. In the final game, he is a Breton, but he has a very defined Imperial name. So my personal guess is that they changed his race so that his specific goodbye would no longer play. But that's just stupid, as it still plays, just without any voice dialogue in the final game. The goodbye is voiced by Wes Johnson and still remains in the game files. So it seems to me that maybe they wanted to alter him like Didier O'Malley, but failed miserably. In order to make up for the fact that I have no clue who the Blade Master was, there is actually some interesting stuff about one of the arena's visitors. In the final game, Broch Kalos is an advanced alchemy trainer, but he doesn't do much in life, usually spending the entire day inside of his house. Now, why is this? Well, just look at the name of the package that causes this behavior. Trainer Bruma, Arena Daily Spectator 9x12. If that doesn't make it clear, I don't know what does. Broch was supposed to spend his days at the local arena and not inside of his house. It was a very well known fact in town that he was a big arena fan and there are also some leftover rumors confirming this fact. He must really know all the fighters by now. And from what I've heard, he knows a good bit about alchemy as well. He loves the place. I've also heard he's quite an accomplished alchemist. It certainly seems to be his passion. I understand he used to be quite an alchemist. I wonder if he'd teach me more about that. The first rumor was meant as a response to a question, while the two others were meant as possible replies to another question. Neither question remains in the game files, however, making sure that the responses go unused as well. And with that, there is no information left about the Bruma Arena. Yep, no known champion, nothing. This brings us to the Chaden Hall Arena, which has some more substantial remnants left over in the files. Just like Bruma, we have remaining markers in the form of Chaden Hall Arena Gatekeeper Marker and Chaden Hall Beggar at Arena. That last marker is still used by the package Chaden Hall Beggar 2 Arena, which is in possession of the local beggar Luckless Lucina. Oh, and these markers are in a cell that is known as Chaden Hall Exterior 10 Arena as well. The markers indicate that the Chaden Hall Arena was to be located where the player home stands in the final game, although that might have not been there at the time. And you guessed it, Bethesda tried to cover up the empty space with the statue once again. We actually know what this arena would have looked like as well as it is shown for a brief moment during the making of Oblivion documentary. For the Blade Master, they actually aren't mentioned in the Chaden Hall NQD script, which would normally mean we don't know who they were. But in this case we got lucky, as there actually is a leftover AI package meant for them called Arena Che Savure Stand. Following the naming convention, Savure is a first name for a female Dunmer. But if you've seen my previous Oblivion videos, then you know that Bethesda doesn't always follow their own conventions. In the past, Savare has also been used as a male Dunmer name, but this still makes it likely for this gatekeeper to have been Dunmer at least, fitting with the town. Because there are no leftover rumors, we don't really know much more than that. But do you know who does have unused rumors? The repurposed gatekeeper, Shelly. 
who now lives a pointless existence without any unique dialogue in the Chadenhall Bridge Inn. I'd like to bet, but I don't want to be told that what I'm doing is sinful. I don't mind betting, but it's not worth having to hear a lecture about it. These rumors are once again responses to a question that was deleted, but they are actually pretty interesting to me, as they play into the theme of Chadenhall being a religious town, which is nice to see Bethesda caring about such a small detail. Whoever Chadenhall's local champion would have been, I can't tell you anything about him, as there is no concrete evidence of anything. I do have something to speculate about, but that's gonna fit in nicely with my next video, as this video is already long enough without speculation. We do know of one NPC that was meant to visit Chadenhall's arena, and that is the eccentric Aldmer Voronil. He still uses a package called Voronil Arena Spectator Sunday 9x12, but because the arena no longer exists, the package just makes him wander around his editor ID location. Before we move on, there's still one character I want to mention, and that's the castle steward Naspia Cosma. Without going too in-depth, basically her entire character is that she would rather fight in the arena than work in the castle, as she'll tell you herself. To be frank, I prefer a career in the arena to this paper pusher's position. A lot of the townsfolk also talk about this. I've heard that Naspia Cosma would rather be fighting in the arena than spending time at the castle. She's excellent with a blade. Naspia Cosma is really skilled with her blade. It's a shame she doesn't compete in the arena. I understand her parents are against her competing. It's quite a shame. I've heard that she's always wanted to compete, but her parents are against it. What I want to say with this is that the dialogue was clearly written when the Chadenhall Arena was still a thing, but because it was so vague, Bethesda just kept it in the game. However, there's still a lot of oddities with Naspia as a character. For starters, one of the rumors you just heard mentioned her parents. But they don't exist in the game. This normally wouldn't be a problem, except that town rumors in Oblivion legitimately never mention anyone that doesn't exist. It also seems to imply that Naspia is a young person, but in the final game she's an old woman. Naspia also possesses this mystery AI package that refers to some kind of tourney with nobles, but doesn't do anything special, and she's the only NPC to have it in the final game. Whatever the case, you can be quite certain that at one point Naspia Cosma had even more ties to the arena than she does in the final game. But now it's time for a real doozy. The Coral Arena. Coral, as you may know, is Oblivion's treasure trove of gut content, and is no different this time around. The Coral Arena was to be located where the Nord Gate is in the final game. This is known because we still have the leftover marker Coral Beggar at Arena, which is still in use by the AI package Coral Beggar to Arena, which is still used by the local beggar Nermus de Mooch. If you're wondering what the Coral Arena would have looked like, you already know. Why? Because the arena in the final game is the Coral Arena. Yes, it was moved over to the Imperial City, but it's still the same as it would have been in Coral. It's even still named Coral Arena internally. A lot of the Imperial City arena also reuses Coral parts for the outside as well. Not only did it reuse the Coral cell in its entirety, it reuses characters as well. Gatekeeper Hundelin and Blademaster Owen were originally located in Coral, as Hundelin is even mentioned in Coral's NQD script. This means that there are unused rumors about him. Not much for wagering myself. Of course, I always seem to lose. I've made some bets. Won some, lost some. I've made a few bets. Made some good money, actually. I haven't done too much betting. Can't say I know enough about the folks fighting to make a smart wager. I haven't done much betting, but I hear some folks have made a good bit of money. Hmm, maybe I should start betting with Hundelin as well. Now, while there is no rumor that can confirm that Owen was supposed to appear in Coral as well, he was created at the same time as Hundelin, so it's just very likely, since Hundelin was meant to appear there for sure. There are actually a lot of other generic rumors about the local arena that go unused as well. Horrible things those arena matches. Simply bloodshed for the sake of bloodshed. Barbaric, I tell you. Do I like the fights? Of course. Everyone likes the fights. The thrill of battle, the sting of defeat, a wonderful time. There was even a topic called Coral Arena that was meant to be used at one point. However, it goes completely unused and there is no dialogue, voiced or otherwise, that's attached to the topic. If you want to know who Coral's champion was supposed to be, you're going to be severely disappointed, as there's no trace of them anywhere left in the game files. Isabel Andronicus and Agronegro Maelok, or the Grey Prince, were created at the same time as well, giving me the impression that they were later added to the Imperial City Arena and didn't exist from the start with Hundelin and Owen. Now if you want to know who was meant to spectate at the Coral Arena, that I can give an answer to. There are three visitors that I know of, and each brings something interesting to the table. 
The first one is Idel the Norman. She's a citizen of the Imperial City, and she still visits Korra in the final game, but due to Bethesda's carelessness, her behavior actually gets broken. See, Ida still uses a package called Ida of the Norman Visit Coral Arena in the final game. This is interesting as she's the only Imperial City citizen with such a package, implicating that local arenas would have likely been visited by traveling NPCs at one point. However, this is where the stupidity comes in. Ida was supposed to leave the Imperial City, go to Coral's the Grey Mare, then visit the local arena and then head back home. Now let me tell you the problem with this. Her arena visiting package sends her to the Coral Arena, but the Coral Arena is now in the Imperial City, with all of its markers as well, meaning that it actually sends Ida back to the Imperial City because her AI thinks that she's still heading to a marker in the Coral Arena. But now for some really interesting stuff. This is Gatern Grogonk. Gatern doesn't really do anything interesting in the final game, but he hides some secrets. First off, there's an AI package called Gatern Grogonk Arena Gallery 16x4 that goes unused but it would have sent Gatern to the local arena each day. It even uses the same marker as Ida Norman's package to do this, but more importantly is the script that's attached to Gatern, going by the simple name Gatern script. I'll give you a moment to bask in its weird glory. So should you not be able to figure it out, this is basically how NPCs would behave at the arena, or at least this particular NPC. But the plan was likely to have similar scripts for other visitors, Gatern would place his bet and if he lost money he wouldn't talk about Coral for a day, likely meaning that this Coral topic would temporarily disappear. If he won money though, then he would have offered you a drink. Now where would he have done this? At the local inn? Well no, it seems more likely that he would have done this at the arena's bar. I know, the arena doesn't have a bar. But it does have a marker known as Coral Arena Bar Marker, placed next to the table with wine in the final game. This either implies that this is supposed to be some kind of bar, or the one that I'm more tempted to believe, that either all arenas or at least the Coral Arena would have had a bar on the inside for visitors to enjoy. Now of course, none of this behavior is ever used in the final game. NPCs don't even place bats, they just go to the arena, sit inside and then just leave. And so we come to the last visitor. This person would have been nobody less than Countess Ariana Volga herself. Cue the rumors. Have I seen her there? Of course. She certainly loves a good fight. I've never run into her there, but I can't blame her for enjoying the matches. Almost everyone likes them. So yes, even the Countess would visit the arena in Coral. That leaves the possibility that all the rulers could do that as well. But there are no traces of this. And yeah, that's the Coral Arena. And while we're here, might as well talk about the original Imperial City Arena. Basically, we know nothing about how it would have looked. The hints that the other towns have aren't applicable here. We do know three things. One, the original gatekeeper for the Imperial City Arena was named Victoria de la Croix. The naming convention indicates that she would have been a Breton female. Her existence is only known due to a remaining AI package called Arena Victoria de la Croix Work, which is linked to the Imperial City Gatekeeper marker. The other thing that we know is that at one point someone named Tuningor would also be present in the arena. Based on the naming convention, they would be a male Altmer. Their role isn't entirely clear as they only appear in the form of two AI packages which don't really give me much to work with. However, his explore package seems to be behavior for practicing melee weapons, while his fight package seemingly indicates that you would have fought him during an arena match. Maybe he was a named opponent? I can't really be sure of that. The third thing we know is that some NPCs have leftovers indicating that they were meant to visit the arena. Both the Dark Elf Mivrina Arano and Wood Elf Metrodel have unused AI packages for this purpose. The third person that would have visited is the Wood Elf Gwynnes, but strangely he only appears during a single quest in the final game. So I don't know when he would have visited, since he doesn't have any leftover AI packages. He does however have this splendid line of dialogue that he would have played only when you spoke to him in the arena. Why do I come to the arena? Honestly? I love the way the combatants move. It's like an, an, an erotic dance. The bodies, the sweat, the... Oh, I, um... <laughs> and with that, we've covered all the risks to the Imperial City Arena leftovers as well. Only two left to go. So let us head over to Leowin. The Leowin Arena apparently once stood where the Blackwood Company now stands, based on a single remaining marker known as Leowin Arena Gate Marker. We don't know who would have visited this arena and we don't know who was the champion either. We don't even know which beggar would have been stationed at the arena as Leowin is the only city without a remaining beggar AI package. We only know of the gatekeeper and the blademaster. 
The gatekeeper would have been Jabari, who, similar to Breville's Andrew Gill, got turned into a master trainer without any unique dialogue in the final game. He even has some interesting rumors about him, noting him as a trustworthy gatekeeper. Have you ever made any bets with Jabari? He pays his debts, but his love of dogs is just odd. I've heard he leaves meat in his backyard to attract them. He's a bit crazy for dogs from what I hear. He pays his bets on time though. Leowen's blade master was apparently a female Khajiit who had a skooma problem. She's mentioned in the NQD script, but it's the unused rumors that tell us the most. I understand Vashanti has some problems with the skooma. That can't be good for her fighters. Vanashti is a frightening one. I've heard she likes the skooma a bit much. As you've noticed, both the rumors for Jabari and Vanashti contain some mistakes. So aren't we glad they cut all that? Can you imagine leaving mistakes in your voice dialogue? And now for our final arena, Skingrad. We actually do know a lot about this one. The Skingrad arena would have likely stood where the statue of Rizl after Righteous now stands, and the marker known as Skingrad Arena Gate marker can be found between the Mage's Guild and Lazara Milvin's house. The local gatekeeper would have been the orc Greg like Crowbuglump. He's just a pointless character in the final game, where he resides at the Westfield Inn. Something to note about Greg like in the final game is that he does have a unique Skingrad topic, but no unique greeting. This was because he was meant to greet you with arena dialogue. Greglag's work-related AI package is also left over in the game files, and of course we have some unique rumors about him that go unused as well. I wouldn't mind making a few bets, but I'm not sure about Greglag. He seems a bit slick to me. The blade master for this arena appears to have been a male Breton named Luc Tirot. The NQD script mentions him with his first name, as does this arena-related AI package, but like a lot of Skingrad citizens, he has some early leftover AI packages that reveal his full name. Luc has no rumors about him. We also know who the champion was supposed to be in Skingrad, the Imperial Knight Vanderell and Trabatius. In the final game, he has no unique dialogue and he is only ever mentioned when he gets kicked out of the player home in Skingrad. However, like Jean-Pierre, he's still part of the Arena Champions faction. There's also an unused AI package called Vanderell and Trabatius Bloodworks, that would have made him train whilst in the Arena's Bloodworks, similar to what Agronite Gromelog does in the final game. Vander Allen has no special weapon with him, but he does have random knight spells befitting his class, so I guess he was supposed to be a knight type champion. And because the Skingrad arena never disappoints, we also know one person that was meant to visit the arena. The also pretty pointless Elsa Godhater, who resides in the Westfield Inn in the final game, just like Rackleg. We know this due to a leftover AI package. And that brings us to the end of the Skingrad arena, and we're left with just one question. Was this all? No, not entirely, but a lot of stuff isn't exactly that unique. For example, Hundelin has some generic betting dialogue in the final game. This dialogue is present in the voice type of every unused gatekeeper. There are generic standing packages for most blade masters, but they don't tell us anything new. The yellow team champion encounter in the final game was once intended to be of hero rank instead. Guards were once intended to give directions to an arena in every city, but I mean I'm just needlessly stretching the video out at this point. There are lots of little things that don't really amount to much, which brings me to the actual final question, should these arenas have gotten removed? Well, yes and no. For one, having only one arena makes it more unique, but on the other hand they had some seemingly interesting ideas for characters such as Jean-Pierre Lamont, Broch Kalos and Venashti that just got completely wasted. The thing that bugs me the most is the reason given. All this content was removed because of space allocation. Are you serious? Do you have any clue how fully cramped this game is with unused content? Yeah, you remove the arenas with the dialogue, but for example, and I'm once again referencing my Bread and Imperials video, those hundreds, no, thousands of duplicate lines still exist in the files. And besides that, I've never seen a game with as much testing content left in the files as Oblivion. I mean, we're talking testing NPCs, testing worlds, testing quests, testing items, testing dialogue. All of these needlessly taking up space. I mean, there are hundreds of testing NPCs that don't serve a single purpose except take up space. So if you think like that, no, I don't think the arenas deserve to be cut, but maybe it was the better choice in the long run. And with that rant out of the way, that was about all the rest to Oblivion's removed arenas. Please leave any suggestions and feedback in the comments and I'll see you in the next episode.